Okay. So how long is the first part? How long yeah, is it supposed to talk? One hour. Okay. One hour. Without without questions. Without questions, and then you have the discussion just here. Okay. And then we have the questions on the presentation, or when do we have the, the questions on the presentation? Uh, I mean, they, they received your text. No, no, of course, but I mean, for so the presentation you have here. 45 minutes, you okay. have then 15 minutes for them. Okay. Then you answer, and then the debate. Okay, all right. Okay, okay, great. So thank you very much, Edouard, to be here today. It's the second time you come for, for this Eshop Plus program. The students last time were really happy, so I'm really happy glad to have you again here. Uh, so you will talk about uh, economics to just transition and full health, so the issue of health and transition in speed. Thank you. You have 45 minutes to an hour, and then please. Uh, Okay, thank you very much, David. So a pleasure to be here. Thanks uh, to uh, to the great discussions uh, discussions that we that we uh, that prepare the the discussion sessions. So uh, just a few words about me. I'm uh, an economist. I'm based in France. I'm based in OFCE, uh, which is the uh, research economic research lab of Sciences Po. Uh, Sciences Po being a university uh, in the center of Paris. Uh, I also teach in Pont Paris Tech, which is a bit different. It's an engineering school, so not the same public as Sciences Po. Uh, and I teach in Stanford University, mostly in the Paris center uh, since COVID, uh, but um, at least for 10 years uh, on campus in, in Stanford. So I, I have an experience between France and the US in terms of teaching and research. And uh, what I will talk today about is this idea that we need to shift our economic system from what I call 20th century economics to two concepts, uh, one of which is gaining momentum, which is just transition. I was just in a conference this morning uh, organized by European trade unions and it was on just transition beyond growth. So the notion of just transition is really gaining <laughs> momentum in the European Union and beyond. And full health is a concept of my own making. So I will try to explain, but I wouldn't say it's gaining momentum. It's just starting to emerge, uh, but I'm so proud of it that I couldn't resist presenting to you. But um, all right. so. I have an echo, which is strange. I have the feeling of being in a very large arena, like, you know, Accor uh, Arena or something. No, it's not, it's not actually unpleasant. It's uh, yeah, okay. No, no, it's okay. No, no, it's okay. Like I'm, I'm feeling like I'm a rock star or something. Okay, so if, if you accept this title, which is 20th century economics, I need to explain what I mean by 20th century and what I mean by 20th century economics, all right? And I think it's very important to have a good starting point to understand where we are and the shortcomings of the, of the current model. So my take, my hypothesis is that we are living in a world which is the world of the 21st century, which has just begun. And this world is ruled by 20th century economics, which was invented a century ago. And I think it was very precisely invented between 1934 and 1936. And this is not a usual assumption, all right? Uh, why 1934? Because in 1934, Simon Kuznets, which is a development economist at Harvard University, is approached by the US Congress, by US Congress members who want to understand the scope of the Great Depression, all right? And their understanding is that the Great Depression is a macroeconomic crisis. It's not a crisis of one sector or another sector. It's a crisis of the whole economy. And they don't have an indicator which can capture the scope, this sort of systemic scope, all right? And macroeconomic theory as such has not been invented yet. And so they go to Kuznets and they ask him to try to build an indicator to grasp the systemic nature of the Great Depression. And Simon Kuznets comes up with the prehistoric version of GDP. Okay, Simon Kuznets is the inventor of gross domestic product, which is being used 
to measure economic growth. Economic growth is the increase of gross domestic product in real terms, all right? So Simon Kuznets builds the indicator before the theory, and he builds GDP as the macroeconomic indicator that will rule decades to come until now and still is ruling our world. It's being invented not as a development indicator, not as a well-being indicator, but as a depression indicator as an indicator that measures depression and not well-being. And Simon Kuznets is very clear that GDP is not an indicator of human well-being. He's being asked this question the minute he invents, invents GDP, All right? So there you have a very important milestone of 20th century economics. And then two years later, John Maynard Keynes publishes the general theory. And the general theory, as you may know, is the most important book of the 20th century in economics, certainly, and is the cornerstone of macroeconomic theory. In it, John Maynard Keynes explains how macroeconomic policy, fiscal policy, tax policy, monetary policy, exchange rate policy, can be used to stimulate economic growth in order to create social progress. So in just this very short time frame, between 1934 and 1936, you have 20th century economics that is being invented. And it has not changed for a century up until now. And if you listen to the Minister for Economics and Finance in France, okay, Bruno Le Maire, not far from here in Bercy, just across the river, which is the, really the, the central command of the French economy and very much of the central, the central command of the French society, Okay, when you look at Bercy, okay, it has a sort of uh, feeling of, you know, stronghold, like it's including its gain, gaining on the river. And if you look at below, just at the river, you have two small boats, which are the small boats that the minister is using to go to the Assemblée Nationale to avoid Paris traffic. Okay, each time you take the subway crossing the river, you look down and you will see the, those two small boats, right? So, so it's like a fortress. It has a, it, it has a feeling of a fortress, and it is very much a fortress. And if you look at, if you listen to Bruno Le Maire, you know, he will tell you, my mission is to stimulate the economy so as, you know, to create social stability. And he very much believes in this 20th century uh, economics, all right? So <laughs> this was invented a century ago. And this is what I mean by 20th century economics, okay? Now, <clears throat> what about, so let's, let's have sort of discussion on the frame of the, on the general picture of where we are, right? What about the notion of the Anthropocene? When does the Anthropocene start? So there is a debate about the Anthropocene. I'm sure you all know what it means, all right? The fact that humans are dominating the biosphere, the geology, the biology of the biosphere. And the first hypothesis in the early 2000s was that the Anthropocene started with the invention of the steam engine by James Watt. That it started at the end of the 17th century, you know, because of the key invention of the first industrial revolution. Now, the International Society of Stratigraphy, which is in charge of dating precisely geological eras, has come up with a new date for the Anthropocene. It said that, well, it, it doesn't start at the end of the 17th century. There was a debate in this uh, International Society of Stratigraphy, and 80% of members said, yes, the Anthropocene is a new geological era, but 80% of members, it was three years ago, said it starts in the 1940s. If you want to have a signal, which is a geological signal of human domination on the biosphere, you cannot see it before the 1940s. And this signal, they say, is the fact that we have triggered nuclear bombs that will dissipate you know, uh, um, radioactive material that will be seen millennia from, from now. And, and so this is the signal of the human domination on the biosphere. I find it very strange to think about the Anthropocene as starting with the detonation of nuclear bombs because it has almost nothing to do with ecological crises. If you look at the graphs of what is called the Great Acceleration, okay, I'm sure you know also the Great Acceleration graphs, what you very clearly see is that ecological crises start in the 1940s, but not because of the detonation of nuclear bombs, okay? It starts in the 1940s because in the 1940s, 
economic growth is adopted as the key standard for development by nations of the world. The key event is not the detonation of nuclear bomb, is the conference of Bretton Woods. Because in Bretton Woods, in July 1944, this framework that was invented by between 1934 and 1936 is adopted as the key framework for what is a developed economy. A developed economy aims at growing GDP, having a high GDP per capita, and using all the tools of macroeconomic policy to achieve this goal. And this is the real start of the Anthropocene. The Anthropocene is the Bretton Woods Conference. It starts with the, the Bretton Woods Conference because from that moment on, all nations try to achieve economic growth and they gradually destroy the biosphere in the process. So I think that what we call Anthropocene is really the growth of scene. I know that you know maybe that there is an, a global game, which is that everyone comes up with its own scene. Like, Someone comes up with the Anthropocene and then comes on, comes up with the Capitalocene and say, no, it's not that. It's... So my scene is the growth of scene. All right. And the idea is that the era in which we are living, which is the destruction of the biosphere, which is very visible in 2022 before our eyes, started in the 1940s with the uh, adoption of 20th century economic uh, uh, mindsets. OK, and you can. And if you want to reconcile this with capitalism and say, oh, yes, but this has to everything to do with capitalism, you could say that contemporary capitalism is a regime that needs endless growth uh, to be sustained. And there you have a clear connection between economic growth, 20th century economics, and current contemporary capitalism, right? So this is basically uh, the general picture. Now, what about the 21st century? Another hypothesis that I submit to you is the fact that the 21st century didn't start with the turning of the millennium. It didn't start in 2000. Centuries don't start at round date. And the reason why they don't start at round date is because round date usually don't have meaning for what comes in those centuries. The 19th century started with the French Revolution and the adoption of the US Constitution in 1789. It didn't start in 1900. Okay, the great British historian Eric Hobsbawm told us that there was a long 19th century and a short 20th century. And what he meant by that is that the 19th century starts in 1789 and it ends with the declaration of war of the First World War in 1914, which is the starting point of the 20th century. And the question is, when does the 20th century actually stop? When does it stop? Okay, what is the end? date of the 20th century. Some people say, well, it was the end of the Cold War because this is the convergence of every economy towards liberal capitalism. So Francis Fukuyama says, this is the end of history that we are living through. And 1989 or 1991, all right, is actually the end of the 20th century because this is the beginning of a new era where all economies, all societies in the world are going to converge toward liberal uh, democracy. And we see how wrong this was. And we saw how wrong it was as early as uh, 1989, because in 1989, in November, you have the, the fall of the Berlin Wall, but in, 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 in the spring, you have Tiananmen. And Tiananmen is the moment when China actually bifurcates away from this model of liberal democracy. And this is very much what we are seeing today, that liberal democracy everywhere in the world is actually under assault. And it was really quite naive to think that it was the end of history. It was the beginning of a new history. So you can forget about this date as being the end of the 20th century. Now, maybe 9-11, but 9-11 doesn't have anything to do with what is the key point of the 21st century, which is the destruction of the biosphere and the very existence of humanity in the face of accelerating ecological crises. So we need to find a date that is relevant for what is going to be the greatest challenge of the 21st century. And the dates I submit to you is April 7, 2020. And the reason why, so it comes late, 
okay? If you consider the 21st century as starting in you know, 2000, it comes late. But I mean, the declaration of the First World War also came late, you know, 1914, it's also late. And there's almost no doubt that it was the starting point of the 20th century. So why April 7, 2020? Well, because at, on this day, 4 billion people were locked down in 100 countries around the world because a virus were killing people by tens of thousands and early and, and soon hundreds of thousands, all right? And this moment when is the moment when humanity actually understands that the destruction of the biosphere means the destruction of human well-being. And that if humanity doesn't find a way in this century to make peace with the biosphere instead of making war to the biosphere, it's going to disappear as a species. So this is the moment when we all lost, you know, 4 billion of us lost where what we have, the dearest thing that we have in our lives, which, which is our social links. And we lost our social links because we destroyed our natural links. So I think it's a very significant moment in the history of humanity. This date, April 7, 2020, right? 4 billion people locked down. It's the first time ever since, you know, 7 million years of human history, right? So this is what I mean by 21st century. And this crisis, okay? Yes. And I was just wondering, um, I don't think that everyone understood that we are just talking about I think everyone was just um, afraid that the nature would destroy us in the sense of like, we probably understood that we are still living in the physical world where um, natural things um, <laughs> have influence on the human population, but maybe we didn't still understand that we are from Earth. Uh, yeah, I'm not saying that we understood it. I, I'm, I'm saying that I understood it this way. I'm not saying that everyone understood that we are doing this. And we will see with, you know, COVID and the origins of COVID that there were two years of hard fought scientific debate on where exactly COVID originated. And some people argue that it originated in the W4 high security lab of Wuhan, which, which is a completely different story than COVID originating where it actually originated, which was the uh, 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 wet market of Wuhan, all right? But I will come to this later on, all right? But I, I'm not saying that people understood this. I'm saying that this is why I choose this date as significant, you know, for the start of the 21st century. And if you agree with this, then you realize that the Great Recession of, 20, uh, of 2009 was actually the last crisis of the 20th, 20th century, okay? And COVID was a completely new type of crisis. It's a crisis of unsustainability. The Great Recession was a crisis of financial unsustainability. You know, uh, you had all the subprime market, et cetera, et cetera. Nothing to do with the biosphere. Absolutely nothing to do. COVID is a recession that was triggered by the profound unsustainability of the economic system. Okay. And I think this is a, a, a type of crisis that we are going to see more and more. And it was, for me, the first crisis of the 21st century in that sense. All right. So, what do we know about, I, I think we are going to keep questions for the end because, yeah, I think that was the, what was just, um, okay, so, what do we know about how unsustainable our economic system is, okay? Uh, there were two papers that were published in The Lancet, which, as you may know, is the most influential uh, medical journal in the world. And they were published right in 2022, a few months ago. The first publication argues that the toll of COVID is actually not 6.5 million people dead, as is the official toll. The actual toll of COVID is probably closer to 20 million people dead. That is, 9 million people dead in 2020 and at least 9 million people dead in 2021. And the reason why is because many countries actually miscounted death by COVID. For example, India said, we have 400,000 dead by COVID and 
people in India were very surprised that the toll was so low because they saw all those graveyards where you actually had people burn because you couldn't bury them. And so what you do is you recalculate mortality using over mortality. That is, you take a normal year, you know, and the a, a amount of people that, that die in a normal year, and then you compare it with 2020 and you count over mortality. And when you do this, you really capture the COVID effect. And the COVID effect is 18 million people dead in 2020 and 2021, so 9 million per year, all right? Probably closer to 20 million because we are missing the Chinese death, okay? It's very hard to believe that there were 45,000 people dead in China from COVID, okay? In France, for the first wave of COVID, we had 35,000 people dead for the first wave. So in a country where aging is as pronounced as China, to believe that it's only 40,000, 45,000 people dead is very hard. I think the, the actual toll is closer to 2 million people dead in China, okay? So it's, it brings us to something like 20 million. Each year, you have 55 million people dying on the planet, 55 million people. So if you agree with those numbers, it means that you have an over mortality due to COVID, which is something like 15%. It's absolutely huge. If you have seen the publication of the HDI report, the Human Development Index report by the UN a few weeks ago, you have seen that COVID not only derailed humanity in terms of health, but also in terms of course of income and education. The highest toll of COVID is actually on education. Okay, and this is not accounted for yet. Okay, the preliminary studies that come, have come out in the US, you know, on the regression in terms of education due to COVID are just staggering. So we have not seen yet the beginning of a true toll of COVID. And this is what happens when you destroy ecosystems and biodiversity, okay? This is what happens when you trigger zoonosis, the kind of which we have seen, you know, more and more in the last 20 years. I mean, some scientists actually predicted that COVID would happen in Wuhan because of this pattern of zoonosis, you know, multiplying at the surface of the earth. So it, it was not a surprise. We are going to see more and more pandemic shocks, okay? Uh, the IPBS actually talks about the pandemic era to talk about the fact that more destruction of ecosystems and, and more commodification of biodiversity is going to trigger more and more pandemic shocks. And this is what our economic systems does to, you know, um, uh, um, health. Another paper was published in The Lancet to try to account for mortality due to pollution. So the normal functioning of the economic system. And again, the toll was 9 million people dead from pollution. And this is just counting air pollution and water pollution. So if you take into account people dying from air pollution and water pollution, it's 15% of global debt. And here again, it's a very conservative estimate because there are studies that argue that air pollution alone kills 8 million people, all right? So it's probably much more. This is how unsustainable our economic system is. Our economic system is killing us, okay? Literally, it's killing us. It's killing us in terms of just how it functions normally, and it's killing us in terms of creating those climate shocks and pandemic shocks. So this is what I mean by unsustainability. And we are just entering this era of deep unsustainability due to the destabilization of the biosphere that happened since the 1940s, since we decided that economic growth was going to be the only indicator that we really care about. Guess what? All the others are actually crumbling down, okay? Biodiversity, ecosystems, et cetera, et cetera. So what I mean by an economic an economy of the 21st century is just an economy embedded between biophysic laws and justice principles. That is an economy that recognizes ecological economics as a frontier, okay? And political economy as another frontier. So economic, economics for me has meaning only if it tells us something valuable about the real world, not formal 
theoretical model that work perfectly without any connection to the real world. Okay, so for that, you know, economics has basically is useless. If it is useful, it has to be, it has to start from, you know, the biosphere as it is and biophysic laws. So ecological economics is just that, okay? It's a version of economics that recognizes the fact that economies are actually embedded in wider reality, in thermodynamics law, in energy, waste, resource, material flows, et cetera. And then an economy that is concerned by how all those resources are being distributed. And this is political economy. And this version, this 21st century economics is very different from the 20th century economics, which basically doesn't account for this because it's so obsessed with growth. Growth will not allow you to see any ecological crisis and it will not allow you to see any inequality. That's the problem of growth. And this is precisely what we need to see in the 21st century because those twin crises of inequality and the biosphere are the two most important crises that we need to attend in the beginning of the 21st century. Okay, so what I'm telling you here to sum up is that we need to move away from economic growth because this obsession is basically destructive and it's actually a suicide pact if we go on with economic growth. How common is it uh, in the scientific community to hold those beliefs? Is this just me being a crazy uh, you know, person or is it just a widely held belief that we need to move away from economic growth. To try to understand that, you can listen to Antonio Gutierrez just a few days ago, talking about at the opening of COP15, our destructive obsession with economic growth. He is the Secretary General of the UN. And he's telling you very clearly exactly what I just told you, that economic growth is just a suicide pact, okay? But what about the IPCC? What about climate scientists? What about what climate scientists are saying? For me, the most important piece of information in the thousands and thousands of pages of the AR6 reports of the IPCC, so the first um, um, volume was published in August 2021. It deals with climate science. The second volume was published in February 2022. It deals with adaptation. And the third volume was published in March 2022, and it deals with mitigation, okay? The first volume dealing with climate science has this table as a centerpiece of information. Who has seen this table already? Okay, so at least it will be a takeaway message of this uh, um, session. This table is actually your future, and very soon it's going to be your present and mine. This table is about the five main scenarios. So the IPCC runs thousands of scenarios, okay? And it has five reference scenarios in order to try to see what the climate future is looking like, okay? And they have those five main scenarios from the most optimistic in terms of emissions pattern to the most pessimistic in terms of emission patterns. And what it tells you here is a very blunt reality, which is that we are heading for 1.5 degree world as soon as 2030. So as you know, the earth has warmed on average since the pre-industrial era uh, by 1.2 degrees Celsius. French have a very hard time understanding that France is actually warming faster than the rest of the world. For some crazy reasons, French, the French think that they are immune from the climate crisis and that the world is warming, but this is basically an issue for Bangladesh and Pakistan. Europe is warming as twice as fast as the rest of the world. France has warmed by already 1.7 degrees Celsius compared to 1.2 degrees Celsius for the global average. Paris has warmed by 1.9 degrees Celsius. Why? Because in Paris, you have steel, you have concrete, you have this heat urban island effect. And so France is warming much faster than the rest of the world. And urban spaces in France are warming much faster than the rest of the world. So climate crisis is a reality for France in the very place that we are just, you know, right now in. Okay, so what those scenarios tell you is that they all converge on one number, which is 1.5 degrees. 1.5 degrees Celsius of global warming as soon as 
2030. And judging from the pace of acceleration of the climate crisis, it's probable that we are going to reach that close to 2030, maybe a bit later, but not a lot later. If you think that our world has warmed by 1.2 degrees Celsius already, but just by 1.2 degrees Celsius, and you look at the world in 2022, you realize that this could be called the column of fear. It is the column of fear because it is truly frightening to think that we are actually going towards this world with a certainty of 100% now, all right? And all the talk in COP27 about keeping 1.5 degree alive, okay? And some scientists saying, stop with this idea. We are going to go over 1.5 degrees, okay? We are going to a 1.5 degree Celsius world and people need to know it. So stop pretending that we can still limit temperature below 1.5 degrees Celsius. Has everything to do with the, where the science is. That yes, I mean, a very important climate scientist told me 10 years ago that 1.5 degrees Celsius was not a reasonable target anymore. So this is truly frightening and it means that we need to protect ourselves and we need to build huge collective protections in order to face this world. And we need to accelerate the building of those protections. But there is another information in this table, and this is this line. And if this is the column of fear, this is the line of hope. This is the line of hope because if you follow it all through the 21st century, you see that we are moving to 1.5 degrees, then stabilizing around 1.5 degrees, and then going under 1.5 degrees at the end of the 21st century. So to be honest, this is IPCC magic. Okay, and IPCC magic means negative emissions. So this is not very credible. Okay, and this is the problem of reasoning in terms of zero net emissions rather than just zero emission, zero extraction, is that you find in the IPCC literature this kind of magic tricks whereby you can, you know, subtract emissions uh, from the atmosphere. And at the moment, it's not credible, but it is a stab stabilization around 1.5 degrees. So when this report came out, it came out in the press, okay. And I thought, okay, so the only interesting question is what on earth is SSP1 1.9? It looks like a robot from Star Wars, right? What is that? How do we get there, okay? How it, was this scenario built? What does it entail? What does it imply in terms of public policy? I want to understand how we can manage to survive in the 21st century. And very oddly, the press in France and elsewhere kept on publishing those graphs without any specifics about those scenarios and what they entailed, all right? Now, if you go to the literature, because you know that the IPCC is not producing science, it's aggregating science, and you look at the 2017 paper, that details those scenarios and tell you very clearly what those scenarios rely on, okay? And you look at the SSP1 family of scenarios, okay? It says that sustainability taking the green road, all right? So you appreciate or not this metaphor of driving, all right? But let's say you can walk, okay? So it's a green path rather than a green road and certainly not a green highway, all right? So taking the green road. And right in the middle of this, you have this phrase. And the emphasis on economic growth shifts toward a broader emphasis on human well-being, driven by an increasing commitment to achieving development goals. Inequality is reduced both across and within countries. So right in the middle of the only scenarios that, vi that is actually viable for humanity in the 21st century, you have a shift away from economic growth. That is, climate scientists are convinced that this is a problem, okay? It's only economists who think that it's not a problem. Everyone else has understood that economic growth is actually a huge problem and is the most potent engine of the climate disaster. Now, if you look at the literature that was out a few weeks ago, one paper really, you know, scared the hell out of everyone. And it was the paper published by those guys on tipping points. Because what they are saying is that 
it would be too easy if we had a linear, linear climate crisis. There is going to be feedback loops. There are going, there's going to be feedback effects between some key points of the biosphere. And what happens at 1.5 degrees? At least we have three or four key vital parts of the biosystem, of the biosphere that start to actually collapse and maybe trigger feedback loops that we cannot control. So it's as is more important than ever to realize this scenario, not to be in a place where we have those tipping points that are happening, all right? Because the whole literature on planetary boundaries has evolved toward the literature on tipping points, okay? So this is, so yes, we need to, to realize SSP, okay? And need to, to make sure that we, we get there. And if you look at the last 20 years, and you do a very simple Kaya breakdown. So Kaya identity is how you break down emissions between population, GDP, carbon intensity, and energy intensity. You very clearly see that we are losing the race of cutting our emissions because of economic growth. Okay, not because of population and not because of anything else. It's because of economic growth. Each unit of economic growth drives us away from being able to cutting our emissions. And it's by far, growth is by far the engine of the climate chaos, all right? So once again, it's not just me and a number of scholars arguing that growth is bad because we believe that GDP is flawed, is that the environmental uh, community is gathering around the notion that one key aspect is to change the economic system and move it the way, uh, the farthest away possible from uh, a mainstream 20th century economic indicators. And this is, was this was for the climate. What about the, the IPBS? What is the IPBS saying about this? So the IPBS is the equivalent for biodiversity and ecosystems of, uh, it's the equivalent of the IPCC, all right? <laughs> he has heard enough, okay. It was for economic growth. So IPBS is, was created in the aftermath of the Nagoya Agreement, and people gathering in Nagoya said, we need to create something which is as powerful in building the scientific consensus as the IPCC, which was created in 1988. And the IPBS is the International Platform for Biodiversity and Ecosystem Services. Ecosystem services is a problematic notion, all right? And the IPBS has published right at the beginning of this year, a report that I was expecting for a very long time, which is the IPBS actually attacking economic growth and mainstream economic uh, valuation methods and arguing that those economic methods, which are mostly instrumental at 75% of published studies, it's about an instrumental uh, approach of ecosystems and biodiversity. And very few of those studies are actually about what matters the most, which is the relation between, as I said, social links and natural links, okay? This is the relation uh, aspects. This is Elinor Rosdrom here, basically, all right? And what we are doing instead is to argue that, oh, the problem is that nature doesn't have a value, okay? So let's put a price on all living things and the market will solve the problem. But the problem is not the value of nature. The problem is the nature of value. The problem is that we are using a single value, which is economic monetary valuation. And we are expecting this type of methodology to produce a different result than what has been going on just for the last decades, which is an annihilation of the uh, biodiversity, right? So the IPBS is actually converging with the IPCC in saying that the main problem is the the kind of indicators and so the kind of framework and so the kind of mindset that we are using. And what they are referring here to is exactly 20th century economics, okay? And they are asking us to please move away from this in order for us to just try to protect ecosystems and biodiversity and not accelerate further the crisis of ecosystems and biodiversity. So you have Scientists on the climate crisis, on the biodiversity crisis, on the ecosystem crisis, which are converging to argue that the problem is the use of this economic mindset and that it's what is driving ecological crisis. And what happens when you just treat nature as an instrument? Well, COVID happens, all right? And two major papers were published in science right at the beginning of the year, all right? Arguing that using data, Okay, we can say for sure, or 
as sure as science can be, that COVID originated on the wet market of Wuhan, which is a place where you have commodification of animals for human use. And no, it didn't happen in this high security lab. So yes, there was a debate for two years, and now the best evidence available suggests that it's a zoonosis. It happened in Wuhan. Actually, you had two variants that were transmitted right at the beginning of this. And so this is a zoonosis, and it comes from the destruction of biodiversity and ecosystem. So this is the kind of things that happen when you treat nature as an instrument and when you don't recognize the importance of our natural links. So this is the problem. Now, what can we do about it? Don't think for a minute that people have not tried to escape growth uh, in the last 150 years, OK? It's, it was just at the beginning of the Industrial Revolution that people understood what the Industrial Revolution was doing to the biosphere. So if you go back to John Stuart Mill, who is a, a, an incredibly prominent uh, liberal uh, economist, okay, in 1848, if you open his Principles of Political Economy, in 1848, John Stuart Mill has a chapter of incredible modernity about the steady state economy, the fact that we need to move to a steady state economy. And John Stuart Mill says in 1848, at the climax of the first industrial revolution that we are destroying the biosphere and not caring about enough about social justice. And this is because we are obsessed with production and we are obsessed by using the economy to just you know, accumulate material wealth. And this eventually will destroy the biosphere, okay? And we need to find alternatives. And he proposes steady state economy as an alternative. This was, this was you know, more than 100, and 50 years ago, and this is the premise of degrowth, okay? There's no doubt about that, that he's talking about degrowth, basically, okay? And it was, you know, economic growth was not yet invented as a concept. It was a criticism of growth before economic growth was invented, way before economic growth was invented, okay? That was this purpose that was criticized. So that was the philosophical age, the first age of growth criticism. The second age came in the early 1970s. Now, if you want to understand our world, you can understand it this way. We are just waking up from a parallel universe of 50 years of neoliberalism. Everything that we are discovering in 2022, we knew in 1972, okay? So basically the limits to growth report. So Dennis Meadows is, is taking a victory lap tour in all the world conferences arguing rightly that he was prophetic with, well, yet he was not alone. There was at least Donale, Donella uh, Meadows with him, all right? But that the Meadows team at MIT was prophetic in arguing that we need to shift away from economic growth in 1972. Now in 1972, the European Commission had discussions about moving away from economic growth. There was a European commissioner named Siko Manscholz who wrote to his colleagues of the European Commission in 1972 in what would become the Manscholt, Manscholt letter. Dear colleagues, I've just read the Meadows report. We are heading in uh, for a, a global destruction. We need to move away from economic growth and build our European economies away from those indicators because we are basically destroying ourselves. All right. That was in 1972. So in 1972, you had awareness. And then what happened the next year? The first oil shock. And the first oil shock completely confirms this scare of scarcity, the notion that resources are running short and that we need to move away to sufficiency. And what happens in European economies? Sufficiency policies. We are starting to build buildings differently, to drive cars differently, to have norms about heating, etc. The 19 degrees Celsius norm was actually introduced in 1978 during the second oil shock in France, okay? So all those sufficiency policies, and remember, okay, 1972 was Europe, you know, you had a conflict at the doors of Europe. Europe took side for one party against another, was punished by an embargo on fossil fuels and had to implement sufficiency policies in a constrained manner. This is exactly what is happening right now, exactly, okay? 
like exact the same scenario is happening 50 years later. And so the problem is, of course, we have lost those 50 years and we are going to pay for this you know, parallel universe with great suffering. But it's not like it's rocket science and we have never seen it. Okay, we've seen it before. We've seen the moment when government says you need to have, you know, energy norms. And right now in all corporations in France, you have conflict on the fact that people are saying, hey, I'm cold. And the manager says, no, no, it's 19 degrees, it's fine. And so you see all of a sudden, you know, people with coats, with scarves, et cetera, et cetera. And, and we are reliving this moment, right? But in 1972, not only did you have the Meadows report on the limits to growth very clearly indicated that we need to move away from economic growth, you also had the first attempt to build an alternative indicator to GDP by those guys, Tobin and Nordos. They published in 1972 the first alternative indicator to GDP that they call economic well-being indicator, right? So that's the second age. That's the empirical age, okay? And the third age, which we are living uh, through right now is the political age, the moment when we say, okay, we have the framework, we have the indicators that everything is going in wrong except economic growth. Uh, we have uh, the empirical tools to actually build those indicators. What we are missing is how to integrate those indicators into policies. And so a very important thing happens in 2007 in the EU, uh, Jose Manuel Barroso, who is the head of the European Commission, organizes the first Beyond GDP conference. So in Brussels, 15 years ago, you have all the best experts coming in Brussels to share their experience on how to build alternative indicators to GDP. What are the limitations of GDP? How can we overcome it with the question of human well-being, sustainability, etc.? Right. So you have this, and of course, you have the UN adopting the uh, SDGs in 2015, which is a very important moment, 17 indicators, economic growth is half of indicator eight. So economic growth is completely marginalized in this framework, except when you look at the picture, you don't see it. You don't see that the strongest political message of the SDGs is the fact that growth is actually marginalized, but it's very clearly marginalized. And then next May in 2023, you will have a big conference taking place in the European Parliament uh, on post-growth bringing together the different streams of post-growth in a sort of reenactment of this 2007 conference. And the challenge for this conference is, is it going to be operational? Is it going to be not just, you know, showcasing all the indicators, but actually using those indicators to change European policies, okay? But this is the political moment that we are, we are living, all right? And so what we need to do is we need to work on imaginaries and we need to work on institutions. We need to work on both because the strength of GDP is not that it's a good indicator in statistical terms. People believe that or say, sometimes say that the reason why, so there is this thing, it's called the GDP paradox, okay? The GDP paradox basically goes something like this. We have been criticizing GDP for 150 years. And yet it is as powerful as it was when it was actually created by Simon Kuznets. So how is it that any, all those criticisms basically go to die and that no one actually takes them seriously? That we have this beautiful literature on beyond GDP and GDP is very much at the heart of every economic policy around the world for all the countries around the world. And people argue that, oh, it's because GDP is so you know, simple to understand. It's one number, so one number to rule them all, all right? It's so simple. No, it's not simple. I'm an economist. I don't have a clue most of the time why GDP increases or decreases. I need to look very carefully at the data to understand. And I'm a human being. I don't have a clue if GDP going up or down has anything to do with my life. And I challenge anyone to tell me that is, has ever seen any kind of connection between his, his or her life and GDP. So it's not simple to understand. Most economists don't know how GDP is being created, all right? It's very difficult to understand in terms of evolution and dynamics, and it's not a good indicator for anything. So no, it's not the problem of statistical strength, okay? It's on the contrary, probably the greatest weakness of GDP. The fact that it's one number and that's being, you know, designed so poorly. The real strength is institutional strength. When you do policy in France, you do it with GDP. GDP is present in three very important dimensions in public policy in France. 
for public finances, when the national par parliament, the national assembly, the parliament votes the budget, it does it with GDP and to increase GDP. Okay, so th it is there that we need to go and track and dislodge GDP in the vote of the budget. Then when you vote for social finance and you finance the welfare state, you do it with GDP. That was the topic of our discussion this morning at the conference. Can we build a welfare state beyond GDP? And most people say, oh, we need growth to finance the welfare state, okay? Which is, I think, a very um, strong misunderstanding. And the third dimension is in European policies. All criteria in European policies are calculated in percentage of GDP, right? So public debt, public deficit, et cetera, et cetera. So GDP is really important. So actually the goal is to increase GDP rather than to shrink it in order, for instance, to have a lower debt on GDP. That was, that was what Italy did. Italy said, oh, we are going to include in GDP all the drugs trafficking and prostitution because then we will have a greater GDP and we will have a smaller debt compared to GDP. So it's exactly the opposite that we should be doing. That is, we, would, we should be shrinking GDP and all the European institutions encourage us to actually grow GDP as much as we can so that we appear more fiscally responsible, right? So this is where we need to find GDPs, in our minds and in our parliaments. This is where GDP is, okay? And this is where the reign of GDP actually is and why the reign of GDP is so strong. Okay, so, <clears throat> um, and then I'm going to, to, to stop. The criticism of GDP has never been so strong, okay? Don't be discouraged. If you are interested at all by post-growth, okay? Don't be discouraged at all by the situation because the strength of the post-growth agenda has never been greater. You have a host of different streams or schools and hundreds of scholars working as we speak to basically uh, get rid of GDP, okay? And it's not just scholars, okay? The European Union is paying attention. You had this year in 2022, millions of euros devoted to research projects that are explicitly about post-growth and degrowth. The latest of which was the attribution of the very prestigious ERC grants to the three top degrowth scholars in the world, which are Jason Eckel, Julia Steinmarger, and Gorgios Kallis, who received 10 million euros by the European Commission to offer a vision post-growth for the European Union. I was myself part of a team that received 3 million euros to, to understand how welfare states in Europe can work beyond economic growth just this year, all right? So it's gaining strength in terms of scholarship. There are now hundreds, if not thousands of articles published in the best journals in the world about degrowth and post-growth. It's gaining strength in terms of the institutions, and it's also gaining strength in terms of the governments you have more and more governments that are actually trying to implement well-being indicators. I'm not saying that they are changing their policies yet, but they at least have to have, they at least are trying, attempting to have a different vision of their own economies using the lengths of well-being rather than the lengths of economic growth. It's 20 times as high as it was 20 years ago. Okay, the number of governments who are actually engaging in those well-being indicators framework. So it's happening. Okay, it's happening before our eyes. And my understanding, and not just my belief, but what I see happening is that more and more people realize the limits of growth and realize the need to build post-growth worlds. Now, it's difficult because you need to make it desirable. It's not just that you need to criticize growth. You need to offer alternative visions beyond and desirable economic futures, right? So what I've tried to do in the last 10 years is to try to come up with a new vision of what it, it would look like uh, to have a sort of world where social systems, human systems are connected with natural systems. And I'm trying to have a vision whereby I have two nodes. So this is basically mitigating ecological crises. And what I'm, I'm saying is that 
the key nod here is going to be health, what I call full health. That is the fact that the health of ecosystems and biodiversity, planetary health, one health, is going to lead to an improvement in human health. And this is going to be accelerated by uh, lowering inequality. So the two narratives that I'm trying to, uh, to put out is that the first is the full health nexus, which is that we can enjoy our social bonds if we take care of our natural links. And this is for me, the main takeaway message from COVID is that we can do it, but we need to uh, be sure that if we don't do it, we are going to lose our social bonds if we don't take care of our natural links. This is what happened during COVID. And the second is, the second narrative is the just transition nexus, which is that our world is going to be more just if it is more sustainable and more sustainable if it is more just. Meaning that the current uh, negative uh, feedback loop is between inequality and unsustainability. And there is more and more work in this field. This field is just a spin-off of One Health and planetary health. But this field is really now very much populated by more and more work on the links between ecological crisis and inequality, right? And this is uh, really what where things are. Okay, I, need, I, I will stop here. Um, uh, I, will, I will send my slide so you can see what I mean more precisely by full health and the connection between full health, one health and planetary health um, and, uh, and how it can be measured. Yeah, thank you very much.